Hello Jumbo Espresso Talk Today community. It's Amma Robin here. Aquaba, welcome to today's Espresso Literary Mentor Talk Show. This is actually our very first literary mentor talk show. So asante sana for coming through for this great and groundbreaking show community. It is also the first episode of our fourth season. That's right. It's gone by so fast, but we're so glad that you've been along with us for the ride. So we decided that our season opener would be a literary mentor talk show. We love books. We love mentors. It was a match. Thanks for joining us for the opening of our fourth season. And thanks so much for supporting us for the past three seasons. You are the reason that we do what we do. Love you guys. Back to business. What is a literary mentor? Is this the first time you've heard that that term? Probably, because I hope I made it up myself. A literary mentor is someone who teaches, instructs, guides, supports, or acts as a mentor through their writings. Yes, of course, it's great to have a live mentor who does all these things. But a literary mentor is great too, because you can go deeper into some issues and refer to them again and again. Okay, I get it. They're not sitting in front of you or they're not on Zoom with you. And you can't text or DM them, but you can keep learning from them through their written work every single day. Our literary mentor talk presents a written work on a specific topic. It's basically a short talk that we have where we present from a book that we found interesting. We read a few excerpts from the book, yes, directly from the book, and start a dialogue about them. And then we'll conclude with a two minute meditation, optional, Of course, that'll be at the end. Why did we start doing an Espresso Literary Mentor Talk series? And that's another great question. I just love your questions, community. Because the Espresso Talk Today team loves reading. You know that about me. We have great experts on the show, and many of them have written books, articles, essays, stories, and even poetry. Some of the writings are very academic. Others are very casual and relaxed, or they can be a mixture. But we're so happy to bring these experts live and directly on the show, but we're also happy to have their work on the show for a discussion. We also wanted to bring some of their other works, like books and and written works for you to discuss and to think about. We can learn from all of it. That's our goal. I'm not going to lie to you. I never lie to you, community. Some of the topics and works will be heavy and difficult for us, for you, for everyone. So we'll take them in small bites and flesh them out together. Remember, we do all this together. We're a community. Our first reading will be from a book called Black Rage by two eminent black psychiatrists, William H. Greer and Price M. Cobbs. Dr. Greer was a, is a former professor of psychiatry at Wayne State University and a former chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Meharry Medical College. Yep, shout out to the HBCUs. Dr. Price Cobbs was an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. He was also a civil rights leader, and he actually created the clinical model of psychiatry called ethnotherapy. Well, Dr. Greer and Dr. Cobbs are with the ancestors now, but their amazing research and their works are still having an important impact on black mental health. The book, Black Rage, was originally released in 1968 following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. However, the book, of course, of course, had been conceived two years earlier during the difficult times of the civil rights movement. This widely acclaimed book has established itself 
as the classic statement of the desperation, conflict, and anger of black life in America today, you know, back then and today too. A new introduction was added in 1992, and that provided a discussion of more recent events. Black Rage tells of the insidious effects of the heritage of slavery. It describes love, marriage, and the family, addresses the sexual myths and fears of black, black people and white people, chronicles how the schools fail the black child, examines mental illness among black people and the psychic stresses engendered by discrimination. And finally, I know this is a lot already, but finally it focuses on the miasma of racial hatred that developed in the United States, why it exists, and what will happen if it's not dispelled. This is a powerful read, and I admit it's one of the heavier books. Espresso Talk Today team member Ben Kopanen will read today's ex excerpts from Black Rage. You all remember Ben, right? And he's been with us from the get. And he is the perfect person to open our fourth season and the perfect person for this literary mentor talk on Black Rage. Let's just face it, he's just perfect. By the way, the Espresso Talk Today team wants to approach these readings with calm and contentment. Our belief is that reading and discussing books should be a relaxed and joyful endeavor. Learning should be relaxed and joyful, even if the subject matter is heavy or difficult. So, let's begin, get into a relaxed state. Let's take a deep breath, open our mind, and open our hearts. Let's get to it. Okay, hello everybody, my name is Ben and you've heard me on other recordings here on ETT, but today I'm going to do something a little bit different. So, first I'm going to read a passage from the book Black Rage, then I'm going to read out some of the thoughts I had on it, and then I'm going to go into those thoughts on a deeper level. However, I think it's important for us to talk about the book Black Rage in the first place. So this was a book written by William H. Greer and Price Cobbs uh, in about the 1960s. And what they did, they were psychologists, by the way, they went throughout the United States and interviewed hundreds of black people on their experiences of just living in America. And from those interviews, they derived certain psychological concepts from their daily lives. They were, they were, they were able to analyze them at a really deep psychological level. It, like reading this book, it was almost like as if Freud had been inserted in 1960s U US. So it was very interesting. But as I said, there were a few passages that really stood out to me. And this is one that stood out in terms of education. So sit back, enjoy, and also be sure to think about it as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts. This is the passage. Children are responsive to the ex expectations of their environment. They read clearly both the conscious and unconscious message. While it is clear that the counselor's expectations and preconceptions of how black boys functioned intellectually prevented him from seeing this child's true capabilities, what is less obvious, but more important, was the parent's excessive concern that their son not be stupid. If they muster so much, if they muster so much energy to keep him from performing poorly, then with his own logic he must conclude that they feel he's very close to being stupid or is very likely to perform poorly, and that it is it's this stupidity, this poor performance, which represents the great danger to them. They reveal in this way their own imperfectly disguised expectation of the child, which parallels that of the counselor. So already from that, I imagine you already have many things to unpack there. But I wanted to read out some of my thoughts. So here they are, at least as a starting point for this conversation. The relationship between my blackness and education has been, well, let's say, complicated. At a young age, one does not necessarily think about how you look and how you learn. However, as I aged, and that nasty thing known as self-consciousness gripped me, I realized that the ways people perceive me will impact my academic performance. The segment I have selected relates to a specific co component of black educational experiences, namely expectations. 
And I think this is someone everybody can relate to in across all walks of life. Now, the authors note, children are responsive to the expectations of their environment. Expectations are standards, and standards are formed by social norms. It is not beyond reason to consider that many white teachers have preconceived ideas about black students based on these norms. This comes at the expense of an accurate assessment based on directly perceived aptitudes and achievements. This can subconsciously influence educators to impose and thus perpetuate their negative or positive ideals of black students. These expectations, and in truth all expectations, prescribe limitations that a black child can easily latch onto. However, there are ever broader as well as micro implications to these propositions. In a general sense, these expectations can be wielded to justify social hierarchies. The rationale follows. Racial differences inform intellectual capacities, and this is more of an assumption. Social stratifications emerge from people's intellectual success across a labor market in capitalist uh, societies. In turn, black people, if black people are at the bottom of the job market, therefore one may logically, based on this rationale, conclude that black people are less intelligent. For a teacher who already holds racial prejudices, this is a nasty and foolish justification to dedicate less time to their black students. Greer and Hobbes recognize the impacts of this rationale to black students. And to paraphrase, they maintain that the black student must work twice as hard as their white counterparts just to be perceived as not dumb. It is then as if black students are in a tight race against stupidity. One slip and they fall back and are eventually held back. This can lead to overachievers and hard workers, but it can also encourage students to disengage from education entirely. And I have to say, in my younger years, I conformed aggressively to the latter over the former. It seemed that there was no point really in setting goals or in studying. I still remember my strong aversion to setting goals. It was almost as if I saw it as a vice. It was more than a thing that didn't make sense. It was something I actively chose and willingly would not do. And I suppose I was thinking, why set a goal if I'm not going to achieve it? And I guess that willingness to say I'm not going to was to overcompensate for not able to, even though of course I was, but it was different in that context. Furthermore, and this may relate to young black men in particular, why enhance your mental faculties if you are constantly praised for the physical capabilities? And that's another reason to disengage from the educational system if one so wishes. If you see you're being praised in one area and you know you have the idea that you could become a basketball player or even a rapper or a track star or any of these things, why dedicate more time to these other faculties where you're not getting any support, or at least perce not perceiving any support. I have to say, at each step of the way, I felt disincentivized, but also a profound pressure to achieve. This profound pressure eventually became realized as I got older, but we'll get to there later. On its own, this is a nasty combination. However, I must say, it also resulted in a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was really never going to be an easy student. I was more stubborn I am naturally stubborn by nature, but I was much more stubborn at the time and had a slightly lower self-esteem. This led me to not only hold on to those beliefs which kept me in a certain place, but also to fight for them and against myself. In turn, everything became an enemy, even allies. And in retrospect, really only in retrospect, I think race had a lot to do with this. However, the expectations which followed it were a much more potent enemy. The belief that one is stupid, as mentioned in the passage, is challenging to actually shake off, at least in the beginning. It's sort of a fixed mindset issue. Think of it this way, I don't know this now so I'll never know it. This naturally creates an aversion to learning and of being open-minded. Hence, my disengagement or whatever disengagement from the educational system and the commitment to stubbornness, even though I became good at arguing intelligently against myself. However, it all began to change once I found ways to actually study, focus, and to engage with the material on my own terms. 
in my own ways, using my own strategies. These racial elements were, and I imagine will always be there, but I managed to create and surpass my own standards. And I can't describe how liberating that is. I mean, really, it's like, it's almost like reading a story about someone just like you to yourself. It's a very out-of-body experience when you're looking back at it. The question of standards and expectations thus changes. It is not why do they have expectations, but rather why don't we create, follow, and surpass our own expectations. Now, I don't like to believe that black people are playing a rigged game, so to speak. I myself have been more privileged than I can possibly imagine. Not that this totally balances the playing field, but I think it's an important disclaimer. I've received many things and I'm absolutely grateful for what I have. But I think it's also important to recognize that the good and the bad as well, to give both of them honor. And nevertheless, to those of us who do believe we are playing a rigged game, consider a different strategy. If we are playing by their rules, we could also be playing into their traps. So why don't we create our own rules and our own escapes? Now look, I'm not trying to argue in favor of segregation. I'm not going there. This is not one of those talks. But I am arguing in favor of existing differently. Now, to exist differently in this sense involves being willing to envision a path and following it relentlessly. In doing so, we create pathways for ourselves through education and into the labor market. Now, black educators are also a vital element of the structure. But for now, we are the students within this system and that we can create pathways for other students as well as for ourselves into the labor market. So those were my thoughts on the text from Black Rage. I seriously high, highly recommend that everybody read the book. I mean, it'll expose the things that you've kind of half thought about and just go so much further with it than at least than I did and maybe than you have done as well. So that's all for today and take care. Peace. This concludes our literary mentor talk on Black Rage. Asante Sana to Ben for his reading and reflections. This is Deep Stuff. We decided to start this series with a powerful look at modern feelings and emotions that black people experience because of racism. And yes, we find that the roots of these feelings are from slavery. But now let's take it down a notch. We know that racial stress is real. The trauma is real. We should never deny or diminish our feelings or experience. Discussing racism is one way to lessen its impact on our bodies and minds. So Sante Sana, thank you for being here. It helps you, it helps me, it helps us together. It helps us as a community. In addition to talking about our feelings, we can also do a short meditative exercise to control the stress. If you wish to leave now, I get it. And Asante Sana for coming today and everyday community. I look forward to seeing you in the next Literary Mentor Talk show next month. Remember, the book is called Black Rage and Our Literary Ancestral Mentors were Dr. William Greer and Dr. Price Cobbs. Asante Sana to them. Remember to send your comments and questions to us on Instagram at Espresso Talk Today. Let's begin our breathing exercise together now. We'll do a short breath counting exercise for two minutes. Yeah, we're gonna do breath counting. See, this doesn't have to be complicated at all. So close your eyes if you are in a safe place to do so. In the first minute, we're gonna breathe in through your nose for four counts then breathe out through your mouth for five counts. In the second minute, we'll breathe in for five counts and breathe out for six counts. Let's just do it. So, let's breathe in, two, three, four, and out through your mouth, two, three, four, 
five. In through your nose, two, three, four, out through your mouth, two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five. One more time. In, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five. Now let's breathe in, two, three, four, five, and out, two, three, four, five, six. In, two, three, four, five, and out. Two, three, four, five, six. In, two, three, four, five, and out. Two, three, four, five, six. Last time. In, two, three, four, and out. Two, three, four. Five, six, and we're done. Thanks for being here, community. And remember, now more than ever, strength, soul, and reparations. Ashe.